Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Urology. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Simone Thavasilin, who is the Section Chief of Urology at the Providence Veterans Administration Medical Center in Providence, Rhode Island, since 2011, and is the current Program Director of the Urology Residency Program in Providence since 2016. Uh, Dr. Thavasilin had done her internship and residency at Rhode Island Hospital with Brown University, and then she was the first graduate of the Minimally Invasive Urology Surgery Fellowship there. Uh, she is an associate professor of surgery at Brown um, University, as well as Brown Urology Incorporated, and she has extensive experience and expertise in endourology, laparoscopic, and robotic surgery. She serves as a member of the Graduate Medical Education Committee of Rhode Island Hospital and is on the advisory committee of the Office of Faculty Professional Development and the Office of Women in Medicine and Science at Brown University. She is also on the board of directors for the Society of Women in Urology, the Society of Academic Urology, and Brown Urology Incorporated. She is a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force for the Department of Surgery as well as the AUA. Uh, this morning she'll be uh, talking about structural competency for the urologist disparities in med medical education, research, and patient outcomes. So good morning, and uh, thank you to uh, the Grand Rounds Committee and Yale Urology for the opportunity to present today on the, opic, uh, the topic of equity and inclusion for urologists. So I'll start this morning with my disclosures. First, my lived experiences as a woman in surgery and as an Indian American, but not as an underrepresented minority in medicine. And I think it's important to acknowledge this privilege and positionality of my identities as it relates to both my ethnicity and class. Second, while I think talking about race and racism, anti-racism, in the words of Dr. Hittleman, is a high value endeavor, it might be uncomfortable, challenging, and we really need to think of it as an iterative process of learning, reflection, unlearning, and then trying again. Finally, while we'll consider a number of issues within diversity and inclusion today, this might inevitably lead to more questions than answers. But I invite you not to worry about whether I'm right, which might not invite reflection, but perhaps a different approach is to consider what mental doors would open if you took these perspectives and what could be the consequences. So my goal for this early hour is to define the terms and language because words matter and thinking about these terms and concepts allows us to use our voices, allies and advocates for a more just society and certainly a more just culture in medicine. We'll define structural racism in medicine and analyze how it affects medical education, research and patient care. So how did I get here? Uh, describing my path in this area of scholarship parallels a lot of my career development, which has been a windy path through the ups and downs of a life in surgery. So I'll own my own imposter syndrome here. My narrow definition of scholarship was my clinical work. I'm an endourologist. I focus on stone surgery and our national conferences are all about clinical innovation and tools and tech. But the issues that I wanted to study and learn about in my change in my sphere of influence have always been centered around the values of equity, equity, teamwork, and justice. This initially started for me through work I did on DEI at the SAU and through Dr. Hittleman's leadership, uh, uh, as well as through the uh, SWIU, as well as the, the group on women in medicine in the, in the AAMC. Over time, this led to opportunities to lead the Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan for the Department of Surgery here at Brown and a year-long training experience and service project through Brown Advocates for Social Change uh, provided me with a community and a network to do DEI work. Since then, I continue to do this at the division and department level and our medical school level through uh, the subcommittee on promotions. And recently, we have gotten underway with the AUA's task force on diversity and, uh, and equity under the leadership of Dr. Tracy Downs. But at the end of the day, I'm a urologist, just like you are, and these concepts were not in my medical training, nor are they part of the AUA core curriculum. But as structurally competent urologists, we need a working knowledge of these concepts and I'll define these terms in order to weave them through how they play out in areas of medical training, research, and patient care. So where do we start? We all know of the George Floyd video showing racism and how this affects policing, but how does this surface in medicine? Well, this is an image from a video that Susan Moore posted. Susan Moore tested positive for COVID just around Thanksgiving time, and she was admitted to a hospital in Indiana where she had to advocate for herself to get access to pain medications and imaging and treatment. She posted a video onto social media around December time and said in her words, you have to show proof that something's wrong with you in order to get medicine. I put forward and I maintain if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. She eventually was sent home, discharged, but readmitted two weeks later. And after posting this video, she did not survive her readmission. 
But this is also Dr. Susan Moore. She was born in Jamaica. She grew up in Michigan. She studied engineering. She earned her medical degree at the University of Michigan Medical School. But her medical degree could not protect her from this outcome. And she was one of us. So I know we're all on Zoom today, but talking about race and racism and anti-racism requires talking. So if you'll indulge me, I'll ask you to think about your initial thoughts on when and in what context did race come up in your medical education? What were the concepts of race that were taught to you? So for me, I trained in an era where race was included in case presentations, where race-based associations like African Americans were at higher risk for sickle cell disease suggested that race was a risk factor for disease. So how do we define race? Dorothy Roberts has done foundational work in explaining the social definition of race. Race is a political system that governs people by sorting them into social groupings based on invented biologic demarcations. Race is not only interpreted to invented rules, for example, the degree of whiteness for biracial people, but more importantly, race itself is an invented political grouping. Race is not a biological category that's politically charged. It is a political category that has been disguised as a biologic one. So this question is a central concept that structurally competent urologists must be able to understand, teach, and defend. Why is race a social construct? So if we start with the example of sickle cell disease, we see that race and geographic ancestry are often conflated. Black people are more likely to have sickle cell disease because of their geographic ancestry, not because they are black. As we know, the sickle cell gene mutation derived from Sub-Saharan Africa is protective against malaria. The mutation is also common in people with ancestry from the Middle East and India. Now, both sickle cell disease and hemophilia are inherited diseases, but sickle cell disease affects over 100,000, mostly black people in the US compared to hemophilia, which affects around 20,000 mostly white men. There are two FDA approved drugs for the treatment of sickle cell compared to 28 for the treatment of hemophilia. And cystic fibrosis affecting only one third of the population of sickle cell disease receives over 10 times more federal research funding. It's in this context that we see the diseases that we treat are racialized themselves. So how do we, as structurally competent urologists, defend the concept that race is a social construct? How do we explain the science? I think these are the key points we need to be able to make. First, that people cannot be reliably divided into racial groups. Second, that there's no relationship between the traits that are used to categorize people into races and associated stereotypes. Third, that over time, geography and environment influence the genetic structures of the human population through natural selection. Fourth, there is more diversity within racial groups than between racial groups. And all people living today are descendant from the populations in Africa. And finally, all people living today are one biologic species. Now, I'm not suggesting that we stop using race to understand health disparities, but rather that we think critically about the history of race in the US and the way we use it in medicine. This quote, that race is a less a risk factor itself than a marker for risk of racism related exposures, reminds us that we should not be using race as a standalone variable that does not explain, nor should our conclusions lead us to view race as the risk factor, an inherent di difference in our biology. Rather, we should understand race as a marker for racism-related exposures and look to understand, challenge, and undo those exposures in an effort to do health equity work. So how do we define racism? It is the discriminatory treatment, unfair public policies, inequitable opportunities, often in reinforcing ways that perpetuate racial group inequality. It is the combination of prejudice and power. But what is the everyday definition? Racism in America is like dust in the air. It seems invisible, even when you're choking on it, until you let the sun in. Then you see that it's everywhere. As long as we keep shining that light, we have a chance of cleaning it wherever it lands. So I think in looking at the forms of racism, the individually or personally mediated racism is clearly the easiest to recognize. But institutional or structural racism refers to the policies, laws, and norms and customs that are enacted at the level of organizations and social institutions that disadvantage some social groups over others. Cultural racism reflects and reinforces the belief that one social group is superior to another. Now, I think many of us as urologists, particularly those that have been othered or marginalized, are primed to recognize and reflect on how implicit bias or those unconscious attitudes that lie below the surface may influence our behaviors and how this operates in our professional life at the individual level. But structural racism is the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, earnings, employment, 
benefits, healthcare, and criminal justice. These patterns and practices in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and the distribution of resources. Certainly most related to us as physicians is how this plays out in healthcare. This is Jonathan Metzl's work on proposing how medicine should engage with structural racism. With cultural competency, a physician learns to identify cross-cultural expressions of illness, learns communication strategies that take into account culturally specific sources of stigma that focus on the individual. Cultural competency training reinforces racial stereotypes and after decades of integration into the medical curriculum, there's little evidence that's effective in addressing health equity. Structural competency, on the other hand, emphasizes the recognition that economic and political conditions produce health inequalities. Structural competency calls on us as physicians to recognize how institutions and markets and healthcare delivery systems shape symptom presentation and mobilize ourselves for the correction of health and wealth inequities in society. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with these graphics depicting equality versus equity and the principle that equity provides resources in relation to one's needs to gain access to participation in society. I think this is a foundational concept to master because equity can seem unfair in our dominant narrative of meritocracy. But we are, we are talking about metrics to select urology residents or select urology leadership positions. I often hear the argument that centers on around equality instead of equity. So I'm going to offer a slightly different perspective on equity through a series of figures from the Center for Urban Education that I got from Dr. Tracy Downs. First, equality imagines an equal world that we care about all students equally. And medical students entering into the pipeline of urologic training have variable access to social networks, to test prep, to financial capital, influenced by their zip code and a history of racial segregation that shapes policies like redlining that impact entry into the educational system. And if diversity leads to loading this boat with a rising pipeline entering a broken pathway, we have a situation of diversity without inclusion. Microaggressions and implicit bias and disproportional remediation, and I will share data on this at the level of the GME, all create a broken pathway. So in contrast, Equity redirects resources to the pathways with the greatest need in an active and intentional effort to provide support, tracking benchmarks on diverse representation, being intentional and active to fill gaps in networks and resources, and move from non-racist to anti-racist practice or from equal to equitable practice. So individual positionality and privilege exists when one group has something of value that is denied to others simply because of the groups they belong to. We all have dimensions of our identity where we have privilege. Certainly for me, my class, being a physician in the medical hierarchy are domains where I hold privilege. But privilege tends to be invisible to those of us who have it, and particularly in the domain where we might actively need to work to see it, to see that dust in our air. So how do these concepts play out in the areas of medical education, research, and patient care? So starting with medic medical education, how is race talked about in medical training, and how do we teach about it? While medical education in general reifies race as a biological construct, these colleagues at Brown analyzed over 300 preclinical lectures analyzing how race was presented. And in the vast majority, this, they implied that race was associated with the biological difference. And only 4% contextualized social determinants of health. This was done by colleagues at my own institution at Brown. This reinforces unconscious physician bias, it reinforces the use of race as a simple, very simple signifier of illness, it pathologizes race itself and treats it as an easily visualized diagnostic tool, obscures its complex role in illness and in racism. Now I see a couple of lines all over my slides, I can't explain those, but I'll ask you to ignore them. Uh, now as we move into the preclinical years, from the clinical years, how is race used in standardized testing? These colleagues also at Brown, uh, Dr. Braun has published on the use of uh, race correction in PFTs, have analyzed over 2,000 questions in the USMLE testing bank for the frequency of mentions of race and whether race when used was descriptive or central to the question, whether the question associated race and ethnicity with a genetic difference. So racial bias in the USMLE is rampant. They found that a quarter of questions did mention race, uh, the vast majority of which used the NIH census categories. And they found that 85% of mentions were for white patients. In cases where race was central, the patient was much more likely to be non-white. And white patients had a wider range of disease than non-white patients. So how do we connect the preclinical education to standardized testing to thoughts and beliefs about how race affects physicians? 
Put another way, how do false beliefs about race as a biologic construct impact us in our clinical judgment? Previous studies have shown that black patients are less likely to get pain medications, and if so, smaller quantities in situations like extremity fracture in the emergency room, in children with appendicitis. Um, and this is true as well in urology. Uh, George Lovely at, at BDWH has published that this is true for patients presenting with kidney stones in the emergency department. Now, these authors surveyed white lay people and medical students and residents and showed that a substantial number hold false beliefs about the biological differences between black and white people, such as that blacks age more slowly, that their nerve endings are less sensitive, that they have thicker skin, that they are more fertile. These false beliefs about biological differences between black and white patients inform medical judgments and clinical decision making. This impacts our uh, racial bias and goes on to affect how we, for, for example, treat pain. So moving from the preclinical years, how is race used on the wards? The answer is inaccurately. Uh, these authors highlight key recommendations that visual determination of a patient's race and their ethnicity is usually inaccurate, that teachers should reinforce that race has limited genetic explanation, engage colleagues in conversation about bias in order to identify the error of using race as a proxy for genetic risk and refrain from recording race and ethnicity in the patient's chart or case presentation unless there's a compelling evidence-based reason to do so. So what are the implications of these results? The implication of these studies showing the use of race in medical education in USMLE testing banks in the clinical wards neglects the diversity of the US population. White patients and their presenting symptoms are seen as the blueprint or the template in our heads of how we learn disease process. Considerations of race and ethnicity only matter when we're then considering patients who are black, indigenous, or people of color. For these patients, the genetic causes of illness are prioritized over the very significant obstacles of social environmental determinants of health. Because we are socialized across medical education incorrectly to conceive of race as a biological construct, this is the dust in our air. We therefore need to reinforce that race has a limited genetic explanation, engage our colleagues in talking about bias, and strive for cultural humility and structural competence. Now, what is the experience of residents in racism? This data shows that residents experience racism through routine clinical care. This survey had a 99% response rate because it was delivered right after the AbSite uh, in-service training exam for over 7,000 general surgery residents and 16% reported racial discrimination, most commonly occurring from patients and families. It's also notable here that over a third reported gender discrimination similarly from, uh, as a very common type of workplace mistreatment, and women reported any exposure to mistreatment at around two times the rate of their male counterparts. Now, what about the experience of residents and microaggressions? Microaggressions are subtle, low-lying, covert acts of aggression, which often as bystanders, uh, including myself, we might be ignoring or minimize or afraid to address in real time. Well, this qualitative study by Dr. Sales and her colleagues uh, assessed 27 minority residents, most of whom were black and most of them who were female, and identified three top themes. First, a daily barrage of microaggressions and bias. Second, being tasked and tasked with being a race or an ethnicity ambassador. This comes up as the so-called diversity tax or the majority subsidy. And finally, the professional challenges of being seen as the other and the isolation that this creates. So how did this play out in urology? What is the data in our field? Published in Nature Reviews recently, our black urology colleagues shared, I have lived and worked in every corner of the US and despite my white coat, I am still often and mistaken for the janitorial services, everything but a doctor. During medical school, physicians discouraged me from pursuing urology. Some said urology is competitive and you're no smarter than the average kid. These are all subtle and covert invalidations that create an environment of exclusion in our field. Well, putting aside the value of justice, why does diversity matter in medicine? The data says that racial congruence between patients and physicians results in increasing trust, time spent with patients, uh, writing longer notes, better patient adherence to medical advice, increased patient satisfaction. For example, black patients are more likely to get preventative services when seen by a race-concordant physician. 
underrepresented minorities are also more likely to provide care to underserved communities. My colleagues and I have published that women who are general urologists are more likely to see and care for women patients. And finally, training and developing a culturally or structurally competent workforce relies and requires on developing heterogeneous environments. So where are we in diversifying the workforce in urology? Well, I share with you here uh, data from the most recent uh, ACGME resource book that shows that the representation of women across all subsurgeries, specifically and uh, certainly for subspecialties in surgery, remains very low. And while this is a growing population of up to 20% of women in our own field, I want to point out fields like on the top here, OB and pediatrics, that despite having a majority of women representation, still lack critical mass for ascension into leadership. Women make up only 3% of chairs and deans, and this hasn't changed at all over the course of the last 15 years when women have been 50% of medical school class and certainly not over the last 35 years. So what is the representation of medical students and residents in the physician workforce compared to the general population? Or put another way, how concordant is the medical workforce to the populations of patients that we serve? This data shows in the dark blue the U.S. census of our population, comparing the pipeline of medical school graduates in the low blue, the total GME pool or the resident workforce, and then practicing physicians. We know our population is 50-50 women and that medical school, we have achieved this. And obviously at the rate of practicing physicians, that is somewhat lower for women. But the situation for Hispanic and Black physicians and the patients that we treat is much more significant. Hispanics make up up to 20% of the U.S. population, yet in the medical school and resident pipeline, they are at single digits. Similarly, Black patients represent up to 13% of the U.S. population and again are in single digits in the workforce. Looking individually at each of these areas for Black resident physicians and where urology stands, Again, we are at single digits when our patient population or concordance is around 13%. And how about the representation of Hispanic residents at the GME level? This also sits somewhere around, we are in the middle of the pack in single digits. But the pipeline isn't just out there. We help build that pipeline by our actions and our omissions. And one of the challenges in discussing active strategies to diversify urology at the local level, at the national level, has been the argument that we do not control the student pipeline. Therefore, my colleagues, including Dr. Tran, assess the rate of underrepresented minority representation compared to other surgical subspecialties. You see urology here in green. And other surgical subspecialties in blue, we also compare this to other, all other medical fields. And while admittedly all of these fields are stagnant, Clearly, both other subspecialties in medicine are attracting and creating inclusive environments more successfully than we might have been to date. So what impedes the diversification of GME and its workforce? Well, the data shows that there's significant subjectivity to the objective measures that we use in our selection processes. So I'd like to look at this data. First, looking at AOA status, these authors at your institution, Dr. Boatwright and Dr. Nuna Smith, found that even when controlling USMLE data for research productivity, for community service, for leadership, that Black and Asian medical students remained less likely to become members of AOA than white medical students. These authors from my own institution at Brown, as well as UCSF, looked at over 80,000 clerkship evaluations for medical students using natural languaging processing and found that white women and underrepresented minorities are more likely to be described by words about their personalities while men were more likely to be described with words about their competency. And then assessing the interview process, there have been a number of single institution surveys across the country with average response rates of around 50%, showing a pervasive culture of inappropriate and biased questions posed to applicants, up to the rate of up to 85%, with significant gender bias against women. Dr. Stephanie Keeb at Northwestern has recently published an update on this literature and data to show that the rates of inappropriate questions have persisted despite new SAU guidelines on match behavior. Finally, imagine yourself at interview day. Uh, Dr. Ellis describes here in the New England Journal the experience of being interviewed while black and describes this as a collision of microaggressions, experiences related to stereotype threat, tokenism, and imposter syndrome. So we've just seen the data showing bias. And if the metrics of selection that we use are USMLE and AOA and letters of recommendation and research, then in the words of Dr. Quinn Capers, are we selecting doctors who have access to test prep, who are viewed favorably in a demographic by the AOA, and have access to nationally known mentors and connections? 
structural problems of network selectivity, resource allocation, at best position us to achieve incremental representation instead of transformative justice. We exist in a system where the structure and policies and norms recreate the same outcome. The system is designed to give the results it does. So we have to ask ourselves, are the candidates that we seek underrepresented in medicine or are they historically excluded in medicine? This is the dust in our air. Now, for those URM who defy structural obstacles, policing professionalism and disproportional remediation of residents who are minorities is a byproduct of an environment that fails to be inclusive. This data presented by Dr. McDade of the ACGME shows that residents dismissed, and I know this is difficult to look at, but they were looking at across all fields, anesthesia down to surgery at the bottom, um, and describing that those residents who are dismissed or fired from residency in up to 2015 across multiple specialties were disproportionately black, specifically and clearly an outlier in surgery. Numerous black physicians at the faculty level, like Drs. Blackstone, Khoury, Danielson and Shim, and most recently Dr. Denner at Tulane, have disclosed their experience of existing in academic medicine amid environments of bias and discrimination. And while these are all single institution N equal one testimonials, taken together, they suggest a widespread exclusion within the Academy of Medicine. So how do we weave these issues in from medical education and our own training? And how do we see this play out in research and patient care? How does structural racism, put another way, manifest in research? Well, imagine, for example, uh, an exercise where you're enrolling patients into an NIH funded study and your PI tells you uh, that you need to categorize each patient, a new participant, um, by the six NIH racial categories. And a participant is checked other for race and put Jamaican. With this information, how would you proceed? How would you categorize them? How would you file them? Well, to emphasize why race is a social contract in the context of research, we can examine something we've all participated in the US Census. This is a survey the US does every 10 years uh, to document the demographics of the country. And in, 19, in 1790, there were only three racial categories, free white males, all other persons, and slaves. Right now, there's 19 categories, and we are considering adding more. But changes in the categories reflect how much more diverse the US has become. And examining the census, it's easy to see the impact that society has on the creation of racial categories themselves. Rather than going through every iteration of the census, I can use myself as an example to describe these so-called shifts of racial categories. I was born in the US to immigrants from India and I identify as Asian American. We can see on the left, no Asian groups were categorized in the census. So it wasn't until the 1800s that Chinese was added. Um, and on the right, you can see two other Asian groups, including Japanese and Chinese were added. So at this point, it's a little unclear where I might've fallen. It was only until the 1980s where I would have been identified as Asian Indian. And these are the categories that remain today. These shifts in convention and social definitions of racial groups couldn't possibly have anything to do with my biology. My body and my biology is the same as it would have been 100 years ago. Now these categories might seem mundane, but how people in the US are counted and referred to matters. Census data is used to design federal funding programs and policy. It affects legislative redistricting and access to economic resources. But most relevant to us, we see the categories reflect the way medical research is done. When we use such arbitrary categories to drive clinical decision-making, we risk reifying race as a biological concept. So race seems to be a concept that's intuitively and biologically based but race is rarely defined in precise or in scientific terms. We should be critical of this because this is fundamentally an issue of scientific rigor when race is used as such an imprecise variable. There are many pitfalls in this process, but there are a number of ways in which race is used the, or the way that we use race in research that it fails to live up to the rigor we would expect of sound science. When used in research, race is not clearly defined as a social variable. It's not usually revealed how race was collected or determined. And race is typically treated as a risk factor, not a marker for other races and related exposures. And finally, analysis or critique being reflective of the fact that these issues are usually related to racism is not usually also included in our analysis. Now the Human Genome Project was supposed to put an end to the biological difference of race or the definition of race. It was revealed without a doubt that humans are 99% genetically the same. And the difference between racial groups or the 0.1% difference that we see is between racial groups 
uh, is not between racial groups, but rather within them. Now, in a highly racialized society, how we produce knowledge about race matters. The questions we ask, the methods and analysis we employ, the conclusions we draw are all influenced by cultural notions of race. Without being aware and working to practice critically, we risk reproducing the ideas about race and the value we give it in society as a means for stratifying social groups in a way that legitimizes this to others. The history of medicine is filled with examples of such science being used to legitimize racism. So how does structural racism manifest in patient care? Well, one of the common forms is in the use of race corrections in our everyday clinical tools and clinical judgment. The use of race correction factors in medicine is so ubiquitous that it occurs across all subspecialties. For example, in cardiology with heart failure guidelines, in pulmonary with pulmonary function tests, in the VBAT calculator in OB, uh, in osteoporosis risk score in orthopedics. But related to urology, renal function estimation equations assign higher EGFR values to patients who identify as black. This is the dust in our air. So within urology, I wanted to share two examples. These are used typically, uh, one, the STONE score, and second, the UTI uh, risk calculator for children usually not typically by urologists directly, but the stone score is used to predict the risk that a patient presenting with flank pain might have a ureteral stone, and a higher risk is uh, assigned to patients of non-black race. By systematically reporting a lower risk for black patients of the likelihood that they might have a stone when presenting with flank pain, this might steer clinicians away from aggressive evaluations at the emergency room uh, level. Also in pediatric urology, where the UTI risk calculator estimates the risk of a child uh, should uh, have a UTI and therefore undergo additional workups, such as UA and culture, it assigns a lower likelihood of UTI if a child is black. This again, systemically, by systemically reporting a lower risk for black children, this might steer clinicians away from more aggressive evaluation. So final thoughts here. I know we've weaved through a lot of uh, topics today. The first, I think, is that race is a social construct. Um, race is a risk factor for disease, it's not a risk factor for disease, but racism, racism related exposures are. Finally, while equality might seem fair, equity is fair. And our objective metrics for selection are subjective. This incorporation of race corrections are ubiquitous in our practice, and we have to look for the dust in our air because the value is justice. I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thanks, Simone. This is Leslie. Can you hear Hi, me? Leslie. I can. Nice job. That was wonderful. Um, so, um, so one of the things, you know, we um, had sort of a discussion around black men, white coats recently, like viewing and then a department discussion with some of the um, DEI leaders at our hospital. And so it really is like a little bit of a, of a mind bend of like how far back you need to look. Like, first of all, the importance of, I, I think we all recognize the importance of diversity. Um, I think it's traditionally been thought of as like a social justice thing, but really it's a health it, it is social justice, but it also has really important population health implications. So um, I guess my question is, what, I guess, are you doing at Brown, like some things that are low hanging fruit that departments can start doing now, like kind of to, to start changing the narrative or doing our part? Yeah. Um, you know, I invite Dr. Hittleman to give a, an opinion as well, because I think he is a leader in this. And I think that what we have started to do, and this has been an evolution, a, a process, uh, is assess our system of selection of candidates for interviews and for the process with which we interview them to standardize it. Acknowledging that standardization only might not be sufficient. Um, but uh, we have put together a scoring rubric for our application review. Um, we have standardized the approach to interviewing uh, candidates such that we use standardized questions as opposed to a bit of a free-for-all. Um, and then I think we are intentional. For example, um, I assess the proportion of the pool that applies to Brown and determine the rate of representation of women and URM, and then assess our interview offers to see if we are in fact proportional. Now, 
I think, and as I reflect on doing this uh, for quite some time, that that's still insufficient. That that uh, you know view of incrementally changing diversity is going to take, if not 10 or 30 years, to move the needle. And so I see it uh, as a persistent um, challenge. Now, I think where we've been successful at Brown, I was the sixth woman to train uh, at Brown, and we've just matched our 16th woman. And so in the last 10 years, we've been 50% women, and, and we've been that way for a decade. So I think the diversity begets diversity. Certainly our faculty reflects it here. We're 30% women. But where we haven't made inroads in progress is at the level of black urologists. And I think that is notable. I think when you are at the inexorable zero, as Dr. Julie Silver calls it, that is a marker of, of bias and discrimination. It's not reasonable for us to believe that not a single black resident would be successful in the program uh, because that defies logic. And, and so I think that it then requires a more active and even more intentional approach to how we look at applications specifically along the areas that we need to recruit. Um, now, I think this takes a lot of buy-in from faculty, and so I welcome discussion across the board because, you know, not as I said at the beginning, I, I asked you to suspend disbelief about whether I'm right about any of this, uh, but just to consider the perspective, I acknowledge that there's disagreement on that, that, you know, that there isn't consensus on that. In fact, the vast majority of us are probably in urology because the metrics that I laid out and the data suggesting that they're biased worked for us. Um, but I think if we're focused on the fact that we would want our workforce to be representative of the population that we're caring for, then we would need a transformative approach. We would need to look at this outside the rubric of meritocracy. Adam, do you have additional ideas? Yeah, so that, was, that was a fantastic talk and, and I, I appreciate the uh, a really generous shout out, especially since I always use your slides in my talk. So it's, <laughs> it's like it's a reflection of you again, um, but I appreciate it. You know, it, it's interesting that if you look at our class and you come to our department, and you look at the wall, we actually historically had a very diverse program. And there was a period of time when we had two black women that graduated and we had, and we had a five year program with, with two per year. So that was 20% of our class. And we had two other URMs that at that same window of time. So we had almost 40% of our class look diverse. So a small change in one year and then four years later when they graduated, it, we looked like a very, you know, I don't know, homogeneous program. And, and it can quickly change. And obviously we're shifting small numbers. So you would think, and it's a zero sum game because those same students, you know, medical students that came into urology were not going to another program. So clearly a small impact getting into med school and then getting into urology would have a profound impact in a program like urology because our numbers are so small. And, and everyone uses the term pipeline and I use that in my talks, but clearly the focus has to be, you know, earlier, because if we have 30 years, as we saw in our discussion of, um, you know, black men and white coats, that, that we haven't had a significant change in the number of, of black men in a long period of time. But even a small number of men would not have made that big of a change in, I mean, it would have made a really big change in percentage. So clearly we're failing at very, very early levels, education levels, bringing people in from communities. And although obviously that takes some very, very early investment, but we have, to, we have to find a way to shift to make medicine more attractive and really improve our pipeline because it has such a broad, broad impact on, uh, on healthcare disparities, the care we provide, even the way people listen to advice and recommendations that they have. So I, I, I'm, I just find it so hard to believe that, that we can't shift our percentage by a significant amount because it's not a huge number change to do so. And we clearly have been very unsuccessful in doing so. I think there's some exciting grassroots uh, work. Organizations like R. Frank Jones and Urologists for Equity, um, Unbound Urology, uh, led by Dr. Chanel Wilson, that are capturing medical students of color who are interested in urology. They are providing access and mentorship. And I think you know that's an opportunity for us as key stakeholders to get engaged. To, last year, for example, I provided application review um, and interview coaching to a series of candidates who are looking to enter into our field um, and being active and intentional about providing them additional access to our networks, um, I think is our, our alternative ways that we might impact this across the country and not just at our own home programs. 
So uh, I would very much encourage anyone who's interested, especially at the faculty, but including the resident level, programs like Yerder at, at a UCSF have you know, created in this last 18 to 20 months opportunities virtually to connect to students um, in, in a way that I think can be very effective. Um, I also see Dr. Downs on the call and I welcome his input. He, he's been a leader at our Frank Jones um, and um, if he'd like to share, although I'm putting him on the spot with this. Uh, thanks, Dr. Thalassilin. Uh, great talk, I'm a little bit on the spot. Um, uh, I just think the way you um, tied everything together was brilliant. And um, I think it's important. We also, we always look at the applicant as the problem and our patients. And we never uh, look at ourselves or our structures. And I think today you really highlighted that in a profound way that I hope will cause people to really do some deep reflection. Um, why are they or are they not using the uh, two African-American women who graduated from that program to um, help recruit back into Yale urology? Uh, what about Harris Foster and other diverse faculty who have uh, diversified urology across all programs are they continuing to ask them how to uh, keep this a sustainable uh, effort? And then the last thing I would add is, and I hope this is a spirit of the AUA Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, is that we look at a victory of diversity being on all levels, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, uh, sexuality, gender expression, gender identity. So for us to only be happy if we achieve those goals across gender and only have one seat supposedly at the table, then I think it's a, it's a wasted effort. Um, we win when we win all together and to make this not a, a zero sum analysis. And that goes also for our non uh, people of color is that for them to also see a victory in this as well. Um, so thank you for an amazing talk. It was a pleasure just to listen and to learn. I, I will follow what you said. Thank you both for speaking. Obviously, you, you both have given great, fantastic talks on our grand rounds, and it's been very inspirational for us. Um, we've reached out, or I should say, actually, we've been in contact with um, Jim Wilson, and, and you know, having those programs where they go to the medical student associations, you know, I, I think is is very valuable. And even going farther back to some of the you know historically black medical colleges, you know, we can do recruiting through those institutions. <clears throat> Obviously, again, it's pulling specifically into urology, but that's what our focus is. And I think that kind of investment and exposure to urology is is very valuable. I think most of us, we reflect how we got to urology. It's the mentors we've had, and uh, and and I think it's important to to provide that focus so we can be good ambassadors for urology and really diversify our field. It, it has huge impacts. Is there, um, sorry. Sorry, I was going to ask a question. Is there is there any evidence, or has anyone looked at whether if a program, a residency program, has a well diversified faculty, many minorities represented on the faculty, that as a result of that, and potentially minimization of implicit bias, there are visible role models for applicants to see that they do better at having uh, more minorities in their program. I think this was just looked at in an article in Gold uh, Journal that's uh, sitting on my countertop right now. Um, and if I remember correctly, um, it was looking at gender specifically um, and found that we were, they were still able to see an increase in female representation despite the lack of female faculty at a program. But I think, you know, intuitively what you're asking here is, um, if there's, if you see yourself in that program, is that going to be effective? And I think the answer to that is yes. I think our diversifying our faculty is critical. Having an active role in recruitment uh, of diverse persons in your faculty, critical. Having, you know, quick anti-bias training right before we enter into those interactions with trainees during interview, critical. Um, so I, I think those key structures we can change about our process, certainly. Um, I think that we also have to recognize that, again, there are many authors sharing uh, in the public domain. There's two major events going on right now at OHSU and in Tulane. 
of, of faculty declaring and putting into, into the light, you know, experiences of significant bias, discrimination on, on lines of race and gender. Um, and so recognizing that our environments of academic medicine are really the opposite of inclusive and sometimes outright hostile and toxic um, is affecting this potential, you know, group of people to take on that burden of being mentors to underrepresented minorities. So I like to look at this as what's the role of the majority? What is the majority subsidy? What is the role of folks who are not URM to, it, in my view, it's to open our networks. It's to actively seek out the role of being a mentor. It's to reach out to these grassroots organizations and say, hey, I'm available and want to help. Dr. Yeah. Thavasil, I wanted to thank you for an outstanding discussion. This is Jamie Caval, I'm one of the Yale urologists, and I apologize, my video is not cooperating today. Um, but I wanted to ask a question. You pointed out how many, there are many applicants, um, especially among underrepresented minorities who may not start at the same rung of the ladder. And then they you know, work and achieve the same um, uh, excellence that other applicants do to urology. And then you know, when we're in the interview season, we may get their application and an application from another individual who's not an underrepresented minority. And let's pretend for a moment that they're identical. How do we account for the fact that one individual overcame great adversity to achieve that same outcome um, and credit them with how they overcame that adversity and, ex and excelled? Sure, we would call this metric distance traveled and how we operationalize the metric of distance traveled into the list of metrics that I showed you that is our current framework, I think is a potential path forward. Now, I don't claim to say that this is easy or easily executable because I think, again, we struggle with the equality versus equity issue here that gets back into our heads saying we're not being equal. I think the answer to that is recognizing the distance traveled is in fact a metric of selection that is of value because we have an opportunity to change what our workforce looks like to be more reflective of our patient population. It, I think it requires us to change and frame what we in fact value. Hey, uh, Harris Foster here, uh, great talk. Um, I'd be re remiss if I didn't um, uh, make, make at least one comment. Uh, Tracy, uh, welcome. Um, I, I sort of wanted to give a personal note um, because I, I mean, I think, um, <clears throat> Part of the problem, and this was brought up to me, brought to me uh, by my son, is the is the input, is the pipeline to medicine, and how it is not um, as attractive as we all think it is, uh, at least to the uh, African male population. So it turns out my son is a um, he's a physician now. Uh, he interestingly chose not to pursue urology. Um, I, I didn't. Um, I, I didn't try to force him one way or the other. He chose anesthesia. But uh, he had watched that, um, you know, the video, the, uh, uh, the white coat, um, black men uh, video. And he called me up that night and he said, you know, dad, you know, it's really interesting how three of my friends, you know, none of them were interested in medicine. And these were three guys that I practically raised with him. We went fishing together. We went hiking together. Um, they went to good schools. These were, sm these were smart guys. Um, I mean, and this is from my, my, you know, my son when he, from three, four, five years old. And none of them had any interest at all in medicine. So, you know, I wonder uh, if, 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 if some of that, and I'm not saying this is something that we can fix here. I mean, I think it's overall a medicine thing, not just a urology thing, but if there are not enough people in the pipeline to get in them to go to even want to go to medical school yet get in medical school and now they've got to become interested in urology i think i think it's a societal issue and some of that and one of the things he brought up was um you know encouragement and you know uh, uh, you know being encouraged to pursue medicine at an early age so um you know this is i think it's an interesting uh issue um but i think sometimes if we're trying to uh, uh approach it at the level of medical school it's already too late I agree. I think the argument that it is very much early in the pipeline is, is critical. I think then we also have to think that, that last year, for example, our Frank Jones in Urology Unbound was mentoring over 35 applicants of color. 35 people, you know, through virtual connection, had interest in going into our field. 
so they're there if we want to look for them. They're there if we want to prop them up. Um, although I do not disagree that there are clear structural, economic, educational, um, segregational histories that are obstacles far before you get to the medical school entry. Hey, Dr. Tavisilo, and thanks for that great talk. Uh, really well put together, very informative. Um, to your earlier statement about having standardized questions during your interview process and um, uh, going, you know, pre-screening the applications as well. Um, you know, one of our concerns mentoring Yale students is, uh, you know, Yale doesn't have grades. Um, they're eliminating step one. Um, and it's not going to hurt the Yale students so much because they're coming from you know, a top tier medical school, but uh, the it's going to, I think, take away some of the opportunity for some of the middle or lower tier medical student uh, school students to rise and shine and, and kind of show themselves without a stellar step one score necessarily to open that that door up for them. Um, I was just wondering how you all are going to be navigating that uh, barrier uh, to find the, you know, the, the diamonds in the rough. Um, as well as what your uh, experience uh, this year or on previous years was with um, standardized questions at your interviews. We, we started a process like that this year and I think uh, overall it worked well, but there were some downsides that we had also encountered. Sure. Um, I think that whether we like it or not, the USMLE and grades interpreting transcripts at this point is like looking at hieroglyphics for some uh, medical schools. Um, I think we are going to have to decide that our objective measures are no longer the metrics that we use. Now, what we're left with then is reading applications for assessment, for example, of distance traveled for, you know, those intangibles, potentially the qualities that you think would might be most successful at your program. I would say it's at that point also that we need to be thinking about what do we want our workforce to look like? Do we want that central center on the value of justice for it to be reflective of our patient population at that moment while reading applications? Our experience with uh, standardized questions, I think overall was um, that we're gonna continue to do it, that we're certainly not gonna re re revert back to what I would call the wild, wild west. Um, I have read all of the papers on inappropriate questions and some are egregious. And um, I think we can be better than that. We should be better than that. Medicine should be better than that. So I think standardization is critical. I'm not sure that standardization is going to, however, uh, still address the potential biases that Dr. Ellis talks about when being interviewed while black. Because I think that we're still bringing those biases into the room uh, when we're engaging with folks. So Dr. Capers, um, you know, suggests a couple strategies on that route. He suggests thinking about what you might have in common with that person when you're sitting across virtually or not. Um, thinking about the opposite. If, you know, if you have a, a thought that comes to mind about a candidate who has a different life experience than you, literally consider the opposite thought. Um, so I think these are active strategies that on a cheat sheet the night before faculty engage with the interview process, uh, we should be handing out and sharing with them. Dr. Ricky and I were just part of a uh, small work group uh, with, from SWU who shared a couple of programs across the country what these active practices are uh, in the interview process. Um, and I think the idea of implicit bias training that's repeated right before we go into interviews is pretty critical. The idea of training the interview, you don't just show up and give it a whirl anymore. Um, the idea that we're going to think about those kind of constructs of othering actively when we're actually uh, using the questions and then continuing to be suspicious about whether or not standardization is still going to give us the outcome we're looking for if the answer is diversity. Uh, you know, being suspicious that maybe standardization might still create the same outcome. Um, so those are strategies and we in intend to do it again. Now, I, I wouldn't say that everyone was thrilled with standardized questions. I think though that we're gonna see the millennials over time are gonna start to expect a little bit of that from us over time. Um, and so I don't think we're going back. I think we're always in this iterative process of improvement and then fail, try again. I think this is no different than you know attempting to be an ally um, against injustice. Yeah, I think we have to kind of work on it. So we're not reading a question off of a card. It's like as if it's a multiple choice question, but kind of making it more of a fluid interaction of, because uh, some of the, you know, you go on the forums and see what the students wrote about you. And it was a couple had written that, you know, that it seemed like the Yale uh, faculty were more interested in me answering questions than getting to know me personally. They interpret that that as 
um, us just kind of pimping them on, and even though they were they were about them uh, within yeah. specific uh, realms. But um, it, yeah, they weren't necessarily. But interestingly, they got better. It seemed like some of them were expecting the questions as the uh, the days went on, and they had they had really quick answers at the tip of their tongues. Um, but maybe as we get more practiced into it, we, we'll be able to ask those questions in a little bit more of a conversational fluid way. So it's not so, and now on to the, uh, you know, the, right. the, the standard portion of the, the interview. I think the concept so. is behavioral-based interviewing. Behavioral-based interviewing is the idea that we are asking questions about real life situations um, and what behaviors they might think of to predict future performance, um, as opposed to, you know, the concept of personality or fit or culture, which are kind of all code for, you know, can we recreate the same? Yeah, some of the things I, I came away from that meeting with Simone that with the SWU members um, and that we were going to kind of follow up on with some action plans was just the concept of repeated training. Like this is interviews are important for us because that's where we can affect, you know, ha have some actually have a, an actionable effect, I think, on the training pool. Um, both the screening, it starts with the screening, right? And then into the interviews, but the screening is really important. But having repeated training throughout the year, Akene actually um, said that she created almost a cheat sheet for her interviewers just to look at, just to make sure it's in the front of your mind, which I thought was great. Um, and then I think it, um, the, the concept of this behavioral-based training, a little bit more proximal to the actual interview process and screening process was brought up. So I think those are three things that are implementable. As I said, I hate to use the term low hanging fruit, but there are some sort of like, I'm not saying they're simple, but they're there for us to, the resources are there for us to engage in and, um, and, and, you know, hopefully move the start moving the needle a little bit. I, I totally agree. I mean, this, we have, um, I think the first step has got to be, you know, recognize, you know, obviously recognizing that there's a problem and then having an intentional, um, uh, approach to addressing the systemic problems that are a contributor and and then overcoming those problems. And, you know, I think this year, you know, as Peru has mentioned, was the first year that we did structured interviews. And, you know, there's certainly, there were certainly pluses and minuses, but I think my hope is that next year will be better. And, um, you know, and I think um, it's only by taking these challenging early steps that I think we're actually will get there. Um, I wanted to, Peruse pointed out that I, there, was a, there was a speed up comment on my picture and I certainly hope that didn't influence your, 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 the pace of your presentation because I have no idea how I did that, but um, sorry. I'm a fast that. talker. I get feedback on that all the time. So not <laughs> all right, well, I, hopefully, it, hopefully it wasn't, yeah, but, but a, what a fantastic talk. And um, we are um, just so grateful to have uh, for your time um, and for your expertise. This was really fantastic. Thank you again for uh, taking the time to come and, and help us and educate us. It was a fantastic talk. Absolutely. Nice to, you Thank know. you for the inter invitation. I appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all at, at some future national and regional meetings. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend, everybody. <laughs>